Hello, everyone. So first of all, um, it's my great pleasure to be here. And I really appreciate your invitation to present my research on this platform. So as Paul already mentioned, uh, I'm, a I'm a professor at the College of Pharmacy at Oregon State University. And on this first slide, you can see the, our building. So my lab is located in this building. It calls Collaborative Life Science Building. And as you can see from the title of my presentation, um, my research laboratory is focused on the development of a different uh, nano platform for imaging and treatment of different diseases, including cancer and endometriosis. So obviously, as you know, uh, during the last 20, 30 years, many uh, nanomaterials were uh, discovered and, and developed. And those nanomaterials, they have different kinds of application in different uh, uh, fields. And specifically today, I'm going to talk about the application of the nanomaterials in the medicine. So usually because of the nanomaterials, they have, uh, you know, they have very small size. And as a result, they have very unique properties which help us uh, to use them for the drug delivery, for the development of new uh, therapeutic and imaging modalities. First of all, I will start uh, with the issue uh, which uh, uh, nanomaterials can help us to overcome in the drug delivery field. First of all, as you know, a majority of drugs uh, which we have uh, to treat different diseases, they are small, small drug molecules. And specifically when we're talking about uh, cancer treatment and, uh, such as chemotherapy. So uh, here you can see uh, some examples of chemo uh, chemotherapeutic agents such as paclitaxel, docetaxel, cisplatin. And as you can see, uh, many of them, they have limited water solubility. So as a result, in order to use them for the systemic delivery, we have to develop some uh, formulations in order to increase the solubility and administer them, for example, intravenous. And as you will, uh, as I'm going to talk in the next few slides, you will see that nanoparticles can help us to overcome that and improve the aqueous solubility of many uh, hydrophobic drugs. Another issue which can be, uh, uh, which can be overcome with nanomaterials could be non-targeted delivery. And it's known fact that um, many chemotherapeutic agents, for example, uh, they have a good therapeutic outcome, uh, especially on the cancer cells in vitro, but when you go, when you move to the uh, in vivo and you inject them systemically, those drugs they don't they go only uh, not only to the cancer tumors, but they also go to different organs and cause uh, severe side effects. So nanoparticles uh, also can uh, help to increase uh, the amount of drug which can get uh, to the cancer tumors. And uh, so on the next slide, I just wanted to uh, to explain you how we can improve uh, how, uh, water solubility of uh, hydrophobic drugs. And right here, we have the example of the classical uh, nanomaterials which we use for in drug delivery calls polymeric micelles or polymeric nanoparticles. And the way how they are prepared, uh, we use uh, the um, uh, amphiphilic uh, copolymer as the building block. So amphiphilic copolymers, they have hydrophobic part and they have hydrophilic part. And when they are prepared in aqueous solution, so uh, they arrange in the way that the hydrophobic part uh, form the core and the hydrophilic part basically uh, form the shell. So that hydrophilic shell make them water soluble and the hydrophobic part right here could be used as the reservoir for the loading of different hydrophobic drugs. So as I already mentioned, uh, nanoparticles, they also can increase the delivery of uh, uh, different drug molecules uh, to the cancer tumor, for example. And the way how it works, we recognize uh, two approaches, passive and active targeting. So the way how passive targeting works, so it's related to the impaired structure of <clears throat> blood vessel in the cancer tumor. So usually those blood vessels, they have uh, the small fenestration or pores, like nanometer size, and when nanoparticles, they are in the systemic circulation, and when they read the blood vessel in the cancer tumors, 
because of those uh, fenestration, they can escape those blood vessels and accumulate in the cancer tumor. We also have the active targeting. The moment when those nanoparticles, they accumulate in the cancer tumor, we can increase the uh, internalization into the cancer cell. And what we can do, uh, we can take advantage of the fact that uh, many cancer cells, they overexpress different receptors. And as a result, the nanoparticles, they can be modified uh, with different uh, molecules, for example, peptide, antibodies, uh, or some small molecules, which can interact with that receptor. And as a result, we can increase the internalization of those nanoparticles uh, into the uh, cancer cells. So uh, on the next slide, I just want to show you uh, one of our projects uh, related uh, to the dis uh, discovery of uh, new drug molecules and the development of the formulation of this, uh, for these drug molecules. So this project was focused on the Ewing sarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, this is the pediatric cancer. And this cancer uh, usually uh, predominantly happen in bones and soft tissue around, uh, around those bones. So uh, what was done, uh, 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 my collaborators and I, so we discovered a new molecules, so we, we named this molecule ML11, and we demonstrated that these molecules uh, technically if, uh, has significant uh, uh, effect on the Ewing sarcoma cells. As, as you can see uh, from this graph, so Ewing sarcoma cells, they're represented by red and, and blue lines. But at the same time, when you try to treat non-malignant cells, uh, such as HEC and NIH3T3, NIH3 so uh, this molecule technically doesn't have any uh, effect, doesn't change the viability of those uh, non-malignant cells. And we also demonstrated that um, uh, these molecules, uh, uh, as represented here with the black line, so it shows the therapeutic effect uh, significantly higher than some drugs like uh, uh, doxorubicin. So all those five drugs, they are uh, currently used for the treatment of Ewing, or Ewing sarcoma. And as you can see here, so the effect on the Ewing uh, sarcoma cells, so uh, uh, our molecules uh, show the, the better therapeutic effect than other three drugs, and the only uh, slightly lower than uh, Winchrystal. So obviously this molecule is very potent and it seems this molecule is very selective uh, towards Ewing sarcoma cells. But one of the issue here, this molecule has limited water solubility. And as you can see here, so the solubility of this molecule is uh, five, uh, around six microgram per, per mil. So again, uh, in order just to, uh, to improve the water solubility and develop the formulation for the systemic administration of these molecules, uh, we use the nanoparticle-based approach, and specifically, we use um, uh, amphiphilic polymer uh, called SPAC-PCL, which has uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic part. And we were able to encapsulate uh, uh, the, uh, our molecules inside of, of those uh, polymeric nanoparticles. And though we end up with the nanoparticles around like 40 nanometers. And as you can see here, so uh, we were able to increase the sol water solubility of that uh, molecule by encapsulation into nanoparticles by more than 300 times. So the solubility increased from six microgram per mil uh, up to 2000 microgram per mil. And on the next slide, I just wanted to show you how the passive targeting works here. So in order to test that uh, this formulation in view, we, we developed the mouse model of Ewing sarcoma by injecting uh, Ewing sarcoma cells in the hind limb uh, of the mouse. And you can see here, so the, there is a Ewing sarcoma tumor right here. And when we inject other nanoparticles, so in order to trace those nanoparticles, we also uh, added uh, some fluorescence dye to those nanoparticles. And as you can see here, this fluorescence appear um, in the uh, hind limb uh, with the cancer tumor. So, so it shows that the nanoparticle, when you inject them uh, intravenously, they predominantly go to the cancer tumors. And our study uh, showed that the, 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 this drug by itself significantly inhibit the growth uh, of the cancer tumor when compared to the, the controlled untreated animals. And especially when we combine this drug with interesting, so we can have very uh, superior therapeutic outcome. 
And also, I just want to mention here that uh, this formulation uh, was non-toxic. And as ex example, so mice during the treatments, they didn't lose body weight. And we also did some other um, uh, studies related to the toxicity. If you want to know more about this project, you can follow this link and read this paper, which, which we just published recently. So another example, uh, so this is the example how we can use uh, nanoparticles for uh, drug delivery and improving the solubility. So we also can, uh, in my lab, we also use nanoparticles to develop some uh, uh, new treatments. And one of the example, we work on the experimental treatment called magnetic hyperthermia. The way how magnetic hyperthermia works when you have the magnetic nanoparticles and you deliver these nanoparticles, for example, to the cancer tumor, and after that, uh, you, you, you apply uh, external or alternating magnetic field. So those nanoparticles, they um, interact with that magnetic field and increase the temperature inside of the tumor. So technically, you can increase uh, remotely, uh, increase the temperature in the cancer tumor, which, uh, which contain uh, magnetic nanoparticles. So benefits of magnetic hyperthermia, obviously, uh, by increasing the temperature, you can kill the cancer cells directly. Or uh, many studies also show that the high temperature in the cancer tumor can in improve uh, the efficiency of radiation therapy or chemotherapy. What the current limitation of magnetic hyperthermia? So the currently available nanoparticle, they have limited uh, heating uh, efficiency. And as a result, in order to, in the, to increase the temperature of the tumor uh, above 42 degrees, uh, so you have to inject those nanoparticles uh, that are intratumorally directly into the tumor. And our lab mostly, so we try to overcome this issue and develop the nanoparticles for systemic magnetic hyperthermia, meaning we can inject them um, intravenously, for example, they go to the cancer tumor and as a result, uh, we can use the external magnetic field and yeah, just kill those uh, cancer tumor. And in order, in order to do that, we develop a new type of nanoparticles uh, in order to increase the heating efficiency we change the shape, we make them hexagonal type of nanoparticles, as you can see from this TM image. And also we uh, uh, those iron oxide nanoparticles with the small amount of co cobalt and manganese. As a result, we increase the magnetization of these nanoparticles, they become more magnetic. And so uh, we, as you can see here from this graph, uh, the heating efficiency of our nanoparticles when we expose them to the magnetic field is significantly higher than the heating efficiency of the conventional uh, spherical iron oxide nanoparticles. So the next step, the, uh, these nanoparticles which we prepared, they were hydrophobic. And again, we used the same strategy as I discussed previously. We prepared polymeric nanoparticles and loaded them uh, with multiple uh, magnetic nanoparticles. So this TN image showed that uh, the, uh, we develop uh, the cluster of those magnetic nanoparticles loaded in the polymeric shell. And those nanoparticles were around uh, 70 nanometers in, in diameter. And also we showed that these nanoclusters, uh, they, uh, the other nanoparticles, uh, show significantly higher heating efficiency than nanocluster of conventional uh, iron oxide nanoparticles. So in the next step, uh, we use uh, the um, mice with subcutaneous ovarian cancer tumor, and we also label these nanoparticles with the fluorescence dye. And as you can see, after the injection, uh, so those nanoparticles, they specifically accumulate in the cancer tumor. And as you can see here, this is the section of the cancer tumor and the blue color. Uh, represent uh, the iron uh, in that cancer tumor. It shows that other nanoparticles, they go to the cancer tumor and they accumulate and they pen uh, penetrate the, the tissue and accumulate in, in the tissue. So in the next step, we demonstrated that when we have uh, the mice intravenously injected with uh, our nanoparticles, when we expose them to the magnetic field, we can reach the temperature as high as uh, 44 degrees. And at the same time, so when we use conventional nanoparticle, the temperature was only like 38, which is not a therapeutic temperature. At the same time, what I just want to emphasize here, the alternative magnetic field, which we use to heat the nanoparticles, uh, doesn't uh, produce a significant uh, temperature in the cancer tumor. So this uh, treatment is specific. So in order to 
um, re increase the intratunnel temperature, you need the combination of nanoparticles and alternating magnetic field. And after uh, we treat the animals, you can see that the treatment with other nanoparticle significantly inhibit the growth of the cancer tumor when compared to number of different controls. All right, uh, so uh, this is the example uh, from my lab, how we use um, nanomaterials for the development of uh, new uh, anti-cancer modalities. Uh, on the next slide, I just want to show you also how we can use nanoparticles to improve the surgery. So it's very well known fact that surgery is the cornerstone of treatment for many cancers. So, and right here, I listed the a different type of cancer um, where, you, uh, where the doctors use surgery uh, to treat them. And if surgeon can remove uh, all or majority of the cancer tumors, the chance for the patient uh, to survive and become uh, uh, and to be cured is very high. So what we want to do, we also want to, to use nanoparticles uh, to help surgeon to visualize uh, cancer tumor during the, the surgery. And our idea is just to develop nanoparticles uh, which can generate the fluorescence. And these nanoparticles, they can be injected, let's say 24 hours before the surgery. And uh, during this period of time, they accumulate in the cancer tumors and during the surgery, they can produce the fluorescence. And also, uh, uh, these nanoparticles, they can be used for intraoperative treatment. And the way how it works, if there are some tumors which are difficult to resect, so the, the doctor can shine the light on that uh, tumor and the nanoparticles inside of the tumor can absorb the light and start to, to heat the tumor. So the way how we develop this platform, uh, we identify the molecules called silicon naphthalocyanin. That molecule uh, can uh, absorb and emit uh, fluorescence uh, in the near infrared range of the spectrum. And it's important because this is the play, uh, this is part of the spectrum which we call biological optical window. So the tissue, they have limited autofluorescence and uh, low absorption of the light. And also, if you shine the light on that molecule, it can produce uh, uh, heat. And obviously, it can be used for intraoperative treatment. So again, one of the issues for that molecule, it's very hydrophobic. And in order to overcome that, again, we use the polymeric nanoparticles and we developed, we loaded those molecules inside of the polymeric nanoparticles to increase their water solubility. And we end up with the nanoparticles around 14 nanometer in size, as you can see from this TM image and the dynamic uh, light scan. So one thing what I just wanted to tell you here, uh, we can have two types of nanoparticles. Some of the nanoparticles in which we can prepare, they always have fluorescence. And when you inject them, so the fluorescence will be, you can detect the fluorescence in the bloodstream, in different tissue. But uh, we also can develop the on-off nanoparticles, meaning if you increase the number of the fluorescence molecules uh, inside of the nanoparticles, so you can uh, quench the fluorescence. And the moment, when the nanoparticles reach the cancer tumor uh, and cancer cells and disintegrate. So you can uh, see uh, the, the, this fluorescence can go back on. And here, this is the example um, of that. So this is the mouse with the cancer tumor. And after that, we injected that mouse. And you can see, you don't see any fluorescence after 30 minutes, two hours, four hours. And it's around six hours we started to see some fluorescence, and this fluorescence increasing, ensuring that our nanoparticle with the off fluorescence that reached the cancer tumor, and they started to dis disintegrate, and the fluorescence molecule they were released and started to produce some fluorescence. So uh, this is the next step. I just want to show you how the image guided surgery works. So we use the instrument called Fluorobeam 800. So, and that instrument can excite the molecules and has the detector can detect the near infrared fluorescence uh, in the body and uh, generate this fluorescence um, and, yeah, and show this fluorescence on the, on the computer, on the screen of the computer. And as you can see here, so we have the mouse with the cancer tumor inject um, uh, these other nanoparticles and 24 hours later, uh, when we use the camera, you can see this uh, glowing light. And actually this light, this is nothing else as the near infrared fluorescence generated by our nanoparticle. So, so as you can see here, it's, uh, this nanoparticle, they make the, this cancer tumor to glow when compared here to the healthy tissue. 
Right here, this is another example. We also use the um, metastatic model of ovarian cancer. So technically, uh, mice, they were injected IP with the cancer cells, which can uh, generate the bioluminescence and it helps us to follow this uh, cancer tumor. And when we inject the nanoparticles, you can see that our, uh, the fluorescence produced by our nanoparticles, uh, it's kind of overlap uh, with the uh, bioluminescence produced by the cancer cells. And after we remove all the big tumors, so this video shows you how, is the, how the image guided surgery work and how we can identify uh, very tiny uh, cancer tumors. And for example, uh, this one, which it's very difficult to see with your eyes, you can identify uh, with the near infrared fluorescence because the nanoparticles accumulated in the tumor and we can see it with the camera. So, and that resected tumor we checked for the bioluminescence. It had the bioluminescence showing this is the, uh, uh, the tissue made of the cancer cell. We also test this technology in the, um, uh, different animal models, for example, rabbits with the liver cancer. And right here, you can see two videos. Uh, uh, this bright color uh, comes from the nanoparticles which uh, accumulated in the uh, liver cancer tumor. So I already mentioned that uh, these nanoparticles uh, can be also used for the intraoperative phototherapy. So, and this is the example. So we had the mouse with the cancer tumor. We injected that mouse with our nanoparticles. And after that, we shine the, uh, the near infrared light of the specific wavelengths. And what we demonstrated, so after one uh, exposure of the cancer tumor uh, to the near infrared light, and just reminder that cancer tumor uh, already have the other nanoparticles, we basically can destroy uh, those cancer tumors. And it and doesn't matter if it's uh, cisplatin resistant or doxorubicin resistant. So uh, this treatment works for all kinds of uh, cancer tumor. And at the same time, uh, I just want to emphasize that when we treat the, nano, uh, the tumors only with nanoparticles without um, light, or when we treat the tumors with light without nanoparticles, we didn't see any effect on that tumor. And the reason why we see such strong therapeutic effect, because here we measure the temperature uh, inside of the tumor during the exposure to near infrared light with the fiber optic probe. And what we can see here, if the tumor has the nanoparticles, the moment when we, you turn on the laser, so the temperature goes up and it can stay as long as you keep the laser on. The moment when you turn it off, the temperature goes down. So this is also an example if um, the laser by itself doesn't hit the tumor, so when you uh, uh, have a tumor without uh, nanoparticles, so the temperature basically stays the same. And the same effect we also notice in the um, uh, rabbits with the liver cancer. We also tested uh, this uh, approach in uh, veterinary clinical trials. So we recruited uh, some dog patients with cancer tumors. As, and as you can see here, so, after the injection of nanoparticles, uh, the, uh, so the cancer tumors could be detected with the near infrared fluorescence. Uh, this was the application of this technology for uh, cancer treatment. So, on the next slide, uh, in the next several slides, I just wanted to show you that uh, nanoparticles could be used for the treatment of uh, some other disease, such as endometriosis. So endometrium, this is the lining of uh, uterus, and endometriosis, this is the uh, disease where um, uh, tissue like endometrium, they grow out, uh, outside of the uterus, in, for example, in the abdominal cavity. And that uh, disease affect like uh, around 10% of uh, reproductive age women, and it is associated with uh, severe pain and infertility. Currently, we, do, uh, we don't have uh, treatment for this disease, so we have some drugs to manage the pain. And uh, in order to improve the fertility of the patient, they go through the surgery, and surgery doesn't work very efficiently. So basically, what we did, we used the animal model of uh, endometriosis. So here you can see those end endometriotic lesions. And we demonstrated when we inject our nanoparticles, those nanoparticles, they also passively accumulate in the endometriotic lesions and just generate the fluorescence, the very bright fluorescence in those endometriotic graphs. 
And importantly here, this is the section of those uh, drafts. And on this section, you can see the green color and the green color represent blood vessel and the red color represent the fluorescence generated by uh, our uh, nanoparticles. And you can see here so that uh, those nanoparticles, uh, they can uh, reach the uh, blood vessel in the endometriosis uh, lesions and they can escape uh, similar to what uh, I explained for the cancer. So basically this passive targeting also work in the uh, endometriosis because uh, endometriosis lesions are angiogenesis dependent. And here we also show that uh, by exposing those lesions to the near infrared light, you can increase the temperature and you can destroy those lesions with the temperature generated by other nanoparticles in the presence of the near infrared light. And the last thing what I just wanted to show you today, how we can use uh, nanoparticles uh, for uh, gene therapies and specifically uh, how we use the uh, mRNA therapy for treatment of cancer cachexia. So cachexia is uh, uh, defined as the decrease of the uh, body weight in, and specifically muscle mass in cancer patients. So uh, according to the statistics, um, uh, 50% of uh, cancer patients, they, have, they lose body weight and muscle mass. And specifically, this number uh, goes to 80% in patients with advanced uh, cancer. And uh, it's very um, sad that more than 20% of the cancer patients, they die from losing muscle mass, but not for, from the cancer tumor by itself. So obviously it's very serious uh, condition which requires uh, our attention. So uh, our goal in this project just to develop the uh, treatment, uh, nanoparticles based treatment, which can increase the muscle mass uh, in cancer patient without um, uh, special diet and exercises. So the way how we approach that, uh, we take into to consideration that in our body we have um, as, uh, TGF beta superfamily proteins, including activin A and myostatin. And those proteins, uh, the, the, they are secreted proteins, meaning they in serum, and they can decrease the muscle mass or negatively regulate muscle mass uh, by um, uh, interaction with the receptor on the uh, muscle cells. And the importance of this um, protein, such as myostatin, it's obvious here on the, uh, the next page. And uh, you can see this animal called Belgian blue cattle. And the reason is so bulky because it doesn't, uh, it's, doesn't have uh, this uh, myostatin protein, which negatively regulate muscle mass. So in our body also, we have the, uh, another uh, type of uh, protein called folistatin. And folistatin can uh, uh, bind myostatin or activin and basically prevent the interaction with the muscle cells so and they don't decrease uh, the growth of the muscle cells. So basically by knowing all these facts, we want to develop uh, the, the, the treatment which can increase the muscle mass. So basically what we do, uh, we want to have the messenger RNA and that messenger RNA uh, can be delivered, for example, to deliver cells uh, after systemic administration and the liver cells using this messenger RNA as a template started to produce uh, folistatin, which uh, after that, uh, this folistatin goes to the um, systemic circulation and in the systemic circulation, it binds to myostatin and activin A, at this, uh, which negatively regulate muscle mass. And as a result, we can uh, prevent the decrease of muscle mass or even we can increase uh, the mass of muscle mass uh, in the patient. So in order to do that, uh, we use the polymer uh, in order to form the uh, nanoparticles uh, loaded with messenger RNA. And here you can see the, uh, this, our polymeric nanoparticles with messenger RNA. And on the next slide, uh, we show the organs from the mice uh, treated with the nanoparticles. And those nanoparticles were specifically loaded with the mRNA uh, for uh, green fluorescence protein. So uh, when you inject these nanoparticles, you can see after four hours, you can start to see some green fluorescence. It means that uh, in the liver and kidney, it means that uh, the other nanoparticles, they deliver uh, those messenger RNA, green fluorescence protein messenger RNA 
to the liver and liver started to produce that protein. So basically it shows that it works and you can deliver messenger RNA to certain cells and these cells, they can produce the required protein. So in the next step, what was done, uh, we uh, use nanoparticles, but now with that statin mRNA. So we injected and we noticed that uh, after the, uh, for example, after around eight hours after the injection, we can increase uh, the level of the folistatin in the uh, blood, uh, like up to uh, more than two times. And that uh, elevated level uh, can uh, last uh, up to 72 hours. And also what we demonstrated here that um, uh, this uh, polystatin can uh, decrease uh, the level of uh, myostatin and activin A. And as you remember, I mentioned that these two proteins, they negatively regulate muscle mass. After that, uh, on this slide, I show you after the uh, chronic uh, injection of this um, uh, nanoparticles with folistatin mRNA, we showed you that in the treatment group, we were able to increase the muscle mass. Here, this is the, the treatment group. We were able to increase the muscle mass by around 8% when compared to the control animals uh, without uh, any treatment. So again, this is another example showing that you can use nanoparticles for gene therapy including uh, mRNA. So in my lab, we also widely use the, the nanoparticles for delivery, the short interference RNA. But unfortunately, I am limited. Uh, I have limited time and I'm not going to talk about that. So um, in this presentation, I just try to show you the importance of uh, nanoparticles uh, in medicine. And today I show you that nanoparticles can be used to improve the water solubility of many drug molecules to increase the, deli the deliver, uh, increase the accumulation of those drug molecules in the cancer tumors and endometriosis. I show uh, that we can develop some new uh, treatment modalities such as magnetic hyperthermia using nanoparticles. And we can use nanoparticles for, for, to improve surgery, not only in cancer, but also in endometriosis. And finally, uh, I show that the nanoparticles could be used uh, for uh, gene therapy. Finally, uh, I would like to thank uh, many people who, who help with this project, especially my lab members. You can see here on these two pictures. I would like to thank my uh, collaborators, uh, financial support uh, from NIH and some other funding agency. And finally, I thank you so much for your invitation and your kind attention. And if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer them. And on the lights, on the last slide, this is my contact information. And yeah, if you have any questions, you always can email me and you can also visit our website where you can learn more about our research, about our publication. Thank you so much.